There we go. Okay, thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, this is Euro Today on this channel, which is also on 281 on DSTV. Well, uh, let me introduce my guest, um, uh, Mubarak Haruna, and um, Victor Achu Tamaklo here with me uh, today. Well, let's just uh, go straight into what the surprise packages could be, or you know, who are proving to be surprise packages gradually in this tournament. And so I'd like to start off on last night's game between Austria and the Netherlands. Let's quickly take a look again and come back for your views. So th there it is, um, you know, a very interesting, you know, tie. Uh, Victor, let me begin with you. A very, very interesting tie. And it just goes to tell us that, you know, some of the teams came here and they really mean business. Well, they do. And I think that on hindsight, we perhaps have not exactly been fair to the Austrian team and what they are quite capable of doing. Because if you look at their journey before this tournament, they've showed everything every indicator that they are a team that you cannot write up. So in the two years since Ralph Rangnick has been in charge of the team, they've had some really credible results. They beat the Italians, who at the time were Euro 2020 um, champions. They drew with the Belgians. They drew with the French national team. And even at this tournament, they only lost to the French team by two deflections that led to that goal that they considered at the last minute. And against the Dutch last night, I think they held their own. If you look at how they've come this far, it should not really surprise you because the appointment that they made in Ralph Rangnick was a very sensible one. Rangnick was essentially the antithesis to Franco Foda, the, man, the manager before him. And his, the set of principles that he represents as far as coaching is concerned are very much wedded to the principles that produced the core of the current Australian team. Now, Rangnick is, is known mostly for his work at the right the sorry uh, red bull and then rb salzburg rb leipzig projects he essentially was the brains behind the recruitment even the determination of what talent identification is what it means to have the talents that they were looking for and it, essentially the project itself he gave meaning to that project from recruitment to the tactical identity to everything he basically gave meaning to it now, if you look at what they have done and the players that they have produced, their players mostly come through Salzburg and the Leipzig in Germany. In yesterday's game, eight of the players who played for Austria have either played at one time for Leipzig or Salzburg, which clearly goes to show you that there's a certain consistency in terms of the idea behind the football that they play. And so, when he sent this group of players out there to go and play, it is not just a matter of familiarity, but the very methods that produced them, the, the training principles that they were exposed to right from their formative years to when they became full-time professionals were forged and fledged by Ralph Rangnick himself. So when he asked them to go out there and then implement those ideas, the chances of them getting that result are pretty high. And I think what we've seen in the last three games gives credence to that. You know, some well, goals coming as a result of blunders and some as well being expertly converted. Um, Mubarak, that just tells you that um, Austria are here for, for, for business and they are not playing at all. Look at the group stages. Uh, look at how the group is looking like now. Um, six points for Austria, five for France, the Netherlands have uh, four, and Poland uh, as well. Yeah, um, for anyone who has followed Austria would not be surprised. Of course, heading to yesterday's game, they've lost just two games in their last 18 matches. I said it here. Uh, to Muftau, they lost to France and they lost to Belgium. It tells you how formidable they are. They are a reflection of their manager, Raf Ragnik, in terms of the way they, they want to play. Achu has elaborated on that. You can talk about the work ethic of the players on the pitch, how they want to chase down every ball, how they want to tackle their opponent. They don't give you any space to brief, any space for their opponent to want to find solution to what they want to do. And it's something that has really worked uh, in this tournament. When you look at the first game against France, they pressed France so high. They did very, very well, and unfortunately, they considered an own goal there. Against Poland, they did so. They scored three. And of course, in yesterday's game, they scored three as well. It was a brilliant performance. The players are a bundle of energy. They are so fit. They don't get tired. I think in the last 10 minutes of the game, the Netherlands were a bit tired, but Austrians, they kept on moving. Their anticipation was so good, where to run, when to run. The understanding between the team 
is absolutely solid. And I think credit should be given to Raf Ragnik. He is the reason why this Austrian team is performing to the optimum. Mm. Well, well, well. Um, more to do here. And um, like I mentioned, there are two games to play today. And then after that, we'll be able to confirm who joins these confirmed teams in the uh, round of 16. Now, um, let's, let's quickly take a look at uh, France versus Poland. And in that game as well, you see a Kylian Mbappe assuming the role of a leader, uh, pushing very hard to ensure that his side, you know, and, and I know that obviously on the personal end of things, he's also looking at clinching this to add to the silverware. He at is. At the early stage of his life. He is, but if you look at the French team, this is perhaps <coughs> the poorest French team we've seen since Didier Deschamps took charge of the team. Mm. Um, for all intents and purposes, if you look at the quality and the profile of players they have got and the tactical solutions that the manager could offer or could provide or even the many ways in which they could individually improve what the team had before, I simply cannot understand why someone like Eduardo Camavinga is not getting a game. And it's all because the manager is still coaching with a handbrake on very conservative, very pragmatic kind of thinking. And so if you look at the team, he's got at every stage of their play, two ball winners in front of that defense just to ensure that they have maximum protective cover. That takes priority for him. That takes precedence over every other thing um, and every other possibility that they could find. And I find that to be a bit problematic in the sense that this is a team that you can let loose. This is a team that you should be able to give the license to go out and then play on the front foot. The fact that he is not, look, we're just talking about the Austrian team they do not have even a quarter of the quality the French team have got. But in the two games that they played against Poland and the Netherlands, their strengths scored far more goals than the French team have managed to do from open play in this competition. In fact, three times the total tally of goals the French have scored in this competition, which is unacceptable. The Austrians scored six goals, three against the Dutch, three against the Polish team. The French have scored just twice. One of those was a penalty. The other was a deflected own goal. Those metrics reflect poorly on the team. Yes, you can make the arguments that yesterday they, asked, they had the XG of over 2.0. 2.3 was it in that game. But if you put intelligence and quality players like the French have got together, they will always create a chance or two. That's a given. But being able to arrive at sustained, choreographed attacking patterns of play, that will be able to, the team will be able to do while maintaining balance. That takes work. And that, that is where I feel the French team have been lacking. But as they have shown us in the last three competitions that they have participated in, Euro 2016, 2020, World Cup 2022, the World Cup 2018, which they won, mm. they don't need to play pretty to be able to get far in these competitions. And it looks like this might just be the template. But as far as I'm concerned, we have to get more from the French team. Mm. More from the French team, indeed. I don't know what your thoughts are because uh, immediately, uh, you know, Fento, uh, <laughs> immediately Victor made that comment. I, I just remembered, you know, I, I was just drawn back to the, the 2000 era where you had, you know, the guys, the guys who uh, claimed victory for France in the 1998 World Cup yeah. coming in there under a Roger Lemaire coming in to show so much quality, so much dominance and lifting the trophy. Obviously, this is not it, but w would you call French, uh, the French uh, national side one that is in transition based on what you've seen, it's, rebuilding? It's not. Look, I don't think this team is in transition. They, they, have, they already have. They have too many established. Yeah. If they were in transition, it probably was a year or two after the World Cup. Mm. Or a year after. But they were, and if you look at, so here's the thing. The, some of the players who are not playing in this team, Eduardo Camavinga, before his 22nd birthday, has played in the World Cup final, has played in the Champions League final. Plays for Real Madrid. Plays for Real Madrid. Aurelio Chouameni, before his 21st birthday, had a World Cup final to his name, had a Champions League appearance to his name. In fact, two had played for Real Madrid for three years. Mm. That's just two of those players, right? Kante, Champions League winner at Chelsea, World Cup winner with France, made the Euro 2016 team, right? I'm talking about Coleman. 2022, Kingsley Coman. He sweeps league titles for fun. Right, then there's Kylian Mbappe. Even in the, the centre-back positions, the places where they've had to make a change or two, it's been Saliba. For all intents and purposes, 
the, the best centre back in the Premier League in the last two seasons. So this isn't a team that is now introducing fresh blood or inexperienced players. Even when they've had to admit new faces into the team, those are players who are elite performers at every stage, be it at club level or in international football. And they are playing or they are taking pressure cooker jobs, never mind their ages, and they are excelling. Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, Arsenal. There can be no excuses. The only excuse is that Didier Deschamps simply is not capable of coaching attacking football, and that's it. And I'm not talking about playing on the front foot against less fancy teams or grade C or grade D teams. That, that's easy because they naturally will sit back and invite you to attack, attack them. But taking that initiative, irrespective of the opponent, while maintaining balance, is something Didier Deschamps is, is, Didier Deschamps is very reluctant to do it. And for me, the paradox of this year 2024 is that the coaches who have the quality to play attacking football are not capable of it. So Roberto Martinez. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Roberto Martinez did a show. Gareth Southgate. And then you've got the coaches who are actually capable of it. Like they don't have the materials to, to play that kind of football. Mm. Like Luciano Sp uh, Spalletti, the Italian yeah. manager. Well, <laughs> this, this issue of quality and uh, who makes up squads is one very key one, and eventually it will be brought to bear as the numbers are pruned down more. Uh, Mubarak, I'll come uh, to you for your thoughts. Let's quickly take a look at the two games, Poland uh, versus uh, France. Let's quickly take a look at that one, and then we'll come back and also uh, take a look at that game between England and Slovenia, a very much followed game around the globe. Uh, Mubarak uh, wanted to watch that goal over and over again, so we had to bring it back. Uh, you know, the <laughs> and I can score that goal, actually, now. You can? can yes. Yeah, but your talent, you're wasted that talent. Oh, for now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you still can't play. You know, you have schoolmates. If you go and change your age, they'll o find you Optimism is very important in life. So. Yeah, yeah, but the, the active age... Dreams you know, do you've come gone true. Past, but you've gone past the active age. Dreams do come true now. Okay, well, you want to be a coach? Or you want to yeah, it's in be a an agent? Where can yeah, yeah, that's fine. You have a better playing on the pitch. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'll be better than Southgate yeah. right now. So, 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 yeah, talk about Southgate. You know, they were held, uh, you know, England was held by uh, Slovenia to a goal -less drawn game. Now, uh, you know, the conversation, like I said, these games and these results are all wake-up calls. Yes, uh, England, England having been performing, especially in the last three games in this tournament, uh, obviously, expectations are high, and this is because they have the best players. They've got, I've always said, they have the, the player who has scored most goals in Europe, Harry Kane. They've got the best player in England, Phil Foden. They've got the best player in La Liga, Jude Bellingham. And they've got one of the best centre-backs playing in the English Premier League, that's Mark Gehi. So the players are there. Now, the most important thing is how do they play on the pitch? I said it here yesterday that we don't see what Gareth Southgate wants to do with these players. There is no system. You are struggling to look at the pattern of play from the players. And he was adamant. Yesterday, he started Conor Gallagher as well. He maintained his formation. And I think he had to accept that the players that he's been parading are not bringing out the needed results. And so he had to bring on Kobimeno, Cole Palmer, uh, Gordon. And these players, they are a bundle of energy. And that's what young players give you. They are a bundle of energy. They give you mobility. When Kobimeno came on, he was very, very good. He stabilized the game. They had control. They had that solid base in midfield. And they were able to attack well. That spark that they lacked from the first two games, he was able to bring that. Palmer was very, very good as well. So it tells you that he's got the quality and that he's just parading wrong players. But one issue that I also have is that these players are using their quality. Are using their quality. What about the instruction of Gareth Southgate? That is very, very important. As a manager, you have to ensure that your team plays to your style, plays to your system. The team should play with pattern, with instruction. Then afterwards, in terms of difficult situations, the players can bring out their technical abilities, they can bring out their ingenuities, and then they can change the fortunes of games. But if England are to rely on the likes of Kobe Menu, the likes of Palmer, the likes of Gordon, to change their fortunes, once they meet a difficult opponent, and surely they will, in the last 16, they are going to meet a team better than Slovenia, better than Denmark, better than Serbia. Once they come up against teams like France, like Germany, the manager must ensure that his tactics will come to the fore. And at the moment, we don't see anything like that from Gareth Southgate. If these players are to use their own ingenuity to rescue England, I think then there's a problem. 
All right, um, a problem indeed. Let's uh, carry on and do some more here. Um, this time I'd like us to take a look at 1992 champions uh, Denmark going up against Serbia. Now, that's why do you always mention the year? I, I, don't, I don't like that. <laughs> you, don't like you know, that. but... but, but I don't like that. Uh, you know, the circumstances under which they won, you know, they came in as a, you know, as a wild card, you know, and, yeah, but and this was after like, Yugoslavia. Yeah, but grew. it's like you want to shade someone. I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> At you? <laughs> so if you talk about 92, 93... Some people are triggered. Ah, well. Why? So that's... <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a quick look at the highlights and uh, we'll bring you some of the analysis right here. All right, so uh, we'll do some more. We'll continue to do some more. Um, uh, Denmark playing against Serbia. Um, yeah. That also... But as you know, yeah. the English problem we're seeing now, mm. it's a decades-long problem. Southgate is... He's out of his depths. But everything we're seeing him do is something we saw in 2002 at the World Cup. It's something we saw in 2006. It's something we saw at the last years in 2004. And the English teams around that period. Remember the problem of post goals? Mm. Sven Goran Eriksson and even Fabio Capello. Ca Capello was more disappointing because presumably he came from a more sophisticated technical background. He produced one of the greatest Milan teams of the modern era and so was expected to have been able to make sense of the talents that Paul Scholes had and find a way to accommodate him, Frank Lampard and Steve Gerrard in the same team. But he couldn't and England suffered for it. Ericsson couldn't. In, at the 2010 World Cup still, they could not. When even Michael Carrick, who's of a similar make as Paul Scholes, English football has always been positively predisposed, but unfortunately to the detriment of technically gifted, deep-line midfielders. They've been positively predisposed to workaholics, hard-running midfielders who can cover the no, distance. No, but at you. Right, and that is why the examples that I've given you in the post Scholes, Gerard era, Scholes was simply the player who had to be sacrificed to accommodate the likes of Frank Lampard and Steven Gerrard, because that is a... The, the sort of talent they can make sense of, right? In the days of Michael Carrick, it was the same. The, the issue with the current English team now, okay. the England's best bet of having any semblance of tactical decency is, in my view, to go with either of Adam Watson and Declan Rice or Menu and Declan Rice. Either, okay. Sorry, either of Menu and Adam Watson to partner Declan Rice and maybe... Jude Bellingham as the third midfielder. I mean, at Real Madrid, sorry, at Borussia Dortmund, he was an number eight anyway. He was a box-to-box -box midfielder anyway. But this is English football. This idea of being able to accommodate a midfielder who is purely a thinker and is not the most athletic so who, of midfielders... Who can now change the narrative the at the moment? Who can now change the narrative? It, it, it requires a cultural reset. No, but Gareth Salgate is in charge. Because, and you see, and it's not only... It's not a Gareth Salgate problem. No, right it is now we're a typical about English. I'm just telling you that it's a problem. As for Southgate, he's a lost cause. I, I don't think he's going to be able to redeem himself. I'm, that's just me. I won't give him the benefit of it because I haven't seen him do that anywhere in his life. Mm. Well, um, let's quickly uh, talk about Denmark as well. Um, the other day I was reading a piece and they were capturing the faces of European footballers who have given back in terms of uh, their, their offsprings and their children to come and uh, play the game. Yeah. And uh, that picture of uh, Schmeichel uh, always would be, you know, Peter Schmeichel is always, you know, etched in your memory because of what he was able to do uh, with that side. Okay, so um, this is what it's looking like now. And uh, based on this, I uh, will show you the table as well very shortly. And uh, this game, I mean, was there anything particular about this game that you, you noticed that caught your attention, this game? As, I mean, the result was flat, obviously. We, we, we would have hoped for goals. Yeah, I'm just uh, disappointed in uh, Serbia. I think they haven't been good in this tournament. They've struggled to create chances. Uh, despite having really, really good attackers, uh, Mitrovic, Vlahovic, they've got good midfielders, Milinkovic, Savage, very, very good players. Yet they've really, really struggled to break any opponents down. Even against Slovenia, it ha they had to equalize in the dying embers of the game. And for me, that is very, very problematic. They are one of the teams who have attempted least 
in the tournament, about 26 attempts. So across the three games, if my mass is good, I think eight attempts per match. And that is very, very poor. Uh, yeah, as a team, you would have to, uh, if you are not efficient in front of goal, you would have to create more to boost your chances of scoring. But at the moment, Serbia are not doing that. All right. So um, this is the time where we bring in um, Abda, Abdul Karim. Karim. Oh, uh, I missed this. Benis. And uh, has the guy Karim, Karim always brings you some philosophy to, yeah. you know, help That's, you Has the guy more. OK. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? Good uh, to see you. It's good to be here, Nat. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> mm. Nat. Yeah, talk to me, man. If I'm, I'm working under you, yeah. then Mubarak comes to ask me, who is Nat? Mm. Then I, I say that I've not even heard about you. What would that mean? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that will be a very interesting, uh, you know, scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe this Can I answer for him? No. <laughs> <laughs> this quote will be familiar. Yeah. If you are not even a coach, how are you going to be the boss of Manchester United? I've not even heard of him. Okay. Who said that? Who it's heard? Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah. And it was a Correct. boss of foolishness. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Correct for three yes. points. Yeah. <laughs> so, in life, eh, we are not living to be happy. It is to be useful, mm. be compassionate, honorable, and make a difference. The important thing is make a difference, difference. live well, and make sure you've lived well. That is according to Ralph uh, Emerson, an American essayist. It's just a coincidence that we are using Ralph's quote to come and support Ralph Ragnick. Mm. Mubarak, who is the father of gang press, Ralph Ragnick. It means that he has lived and has made a difference, and we are talking about it. No matter how much people are disrespecting you, you must be focused on your goal. Yes. We are seeing Austria in this tournament, if you are talking about cohesiveness, that is one of the teams or the most, the team at the top that you can associate that word with, but not the team that they've played against. That is the Netherlands. Mm. They certainly have talent, but the coaching is not making us see the cohesiveness we are supposed to see in them. It's not for the lack of talent that they are not playing well. So let's look at the stats generally from the game. In terms of um, goals scored, we've seen it that the Netherlands scored two goals mm. and, the, and then Austria scored three. Looking at expected goals, then the Netherlands were expected to score just two and they did just that. But Austria, they were expected to score just one and they outperformed that by scoring two more. Looking at it that because of how good they are, if you are looking at the whole competition up to this point after um, three games played in the group stages, they've scored six goals and they were expected to just score four. It means that they are dangerous and a team that every team that is coming up against should be afraid of. But the Netherlands uh, shots, attempting 11 shots in the game and getting a, an XG of 1.62, it means that the quality chances are not there. And they created four big chances in this game and they are missing them as well. Missed two of the three of the four big chances they've created. And Austria, they created two big chances and converted that. Now, let's move on to individual players that will emphasize the philosophy of Ralph Ragnick. These are the tackles made in the game. His game thrives on what? Pressing. And it means that he must have runners in the midfield. All that is mostly dependent on the midfielders he plays in the game. So these are the tackles won in the game. Out of the five, the top five in the game, Three of them were Austria players. And if you are combining that top 10 in terms of the totals of the Netherlands and Austria, the two players of the Netherlands that are in the mid, uh, middle of it, in the yellow, they created, uh, they won just six tackles. And the four players, uh, three players of Austria, they won 10 tackles. That oh. is, they are totally doing it in a way that they will even allow you the time and um, space to do what you want to uh, do. So now let's look at another one. These are metrics for, um, for midfielders. Look at recoveries in the game. This one too. The Netherlands dominated. Move, um, when I move it to the recoveries. In terms of the recoveries, if you are looking at it, the Netherlands had more players in the top two after the final whistle. But in the first half, just to emphasize what um, Ralph Ragni wants from his players, four of his midfielders won um, one back possession more than three times. But for the Netherlands, only two 
only two of the four players were able to win possession just more than two times. It means that if you are going to win, is Ralf Ragnick, his team is winning, and they are doing it in his uh, own way. That is the philosophy he is deploying, and we are seeing it perfectly well. It means that when you are trying it somewhere and it's not working and people are trying to discredit you, don't, if people are trying to discredit you, don't mind the detractors. Just focus on what you want to do, and Ralf Ragnick is showing the way. Well, Ranić has given us a great, great uh, food for thought as well because of the way he's executed play uh, with uh, his side. Uh, Karim, thank you so, so much. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll do a round of messages, and immediately after that, we'll come back to bring you some more. Look ahead to the games that we played later tonight and uh, look at where it possibly will be going. Remember, we're here on Euros Today on Joy Prime on DSTV on 281. All right, so gentlemen, um, there it is. Today we'll be confirming two more teams, right? Yeah. Uh, to, to join, you know, uh, all the already qualified sides to get into the, um, you know, round of 16. All right, so um, let's quickly take a look at uh, Slovakia versus Romania, uh, where it, it looks like it could be going. I mean, I'm throwing back, I'm looking at uh, Romania and I'm looking about, I mean, I'm looking back at the glory days of Georgi Haji and all these guys who were just amazing. And, you know, now it's a big clash within Eastern Europe. And Eastern Europe has really come to the party in terms of showing a certain level of strength. I mean, Croatia at the helm. Croatia haven't really uh, lived up to how we would expect them to play. But where do you see this going, Slovakia versus Romania? I think my money is on Romania. They are, I think, better, better suited to the needs of, of this particular game in the sense that Yes, it is good that they've, they've showed a, a lot of grit and character, both sets of teams, that where they do not have a lot of attacking talents and so need to be very disciplined at the back and not give away much, this is a game where you are expected to play on the front foot. You have to play, take the initiative. And the fact that Romania have shown a certain flexibility and capacity to find balance while playing on the, on the front foot, in the moments that they've done that, is what makes me a bit more open to the idea that they are quite capable of getting the results in this game. Um, never mind what Slo Slovakia did against Belgium, which was uh, an anomaly. If you play that game nine out of ten times, the Belgians are going to run out as winners. And, and I think that this is a game that is suited to the unique skill sets of the Romanians as they come into this one. If, if, if I think the best Slovakia are going to get from this game has to be a draw. Because... What made Belgium susceptible in that game, what made Ukraine also a bit susceptible to the threat of Slovakia is something that Romania are going to be immune to, right? Which is the responsibility and the expectation that they have to attack from minutes one to 90. Romania are not Belgium. Romania are not Austria. Romania are not any of those mid-range or mid-rank teams in Europe who you would expect that when they step up against Slovakia, they have to go there and they will be minded by their expectations and the weight of them to the extent that it will influence the way they set up and the approach to the game. So I think Romania are making this one. Um, you agree? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, I think Romania, um, especially with that emphatic win over Ukraine in their first game, is giving them confidence that they could score. And uh, when you look at their performance against uh, Belgium, they were quite open, and Belgium capitalized on that. But they had so many chances, so that is obviously going to boost their confidence. And I think we'll see a lot of goals in that game. Hmm. All right, so um, uh, we'll have the fixtures uh, one more time. And as you all uh, know, uh, Group E is surely, surely a very tight one. You know, three points for everybody. Uh, Romania, Belgium, Slovakia, and Ukraine. So it sure could be anybody's game. Yeah. But, and but of course, on the emotional really... end of things, yeah. Ukraine... Would be, would be looking for, for to doing this for their people as they find themselves in a very uh, tough, you know? They have to earn it. Yeah. <laughs> they have to earn it on the pitch. I, I have not been comfortable with the adjustment that the manager has made because I thought the decision to play Alexander Zinchenko in midfield should have been a no-brainer, but somehow he's gone back on it and he's left playing back. him in left back. The guy has lost pace. He's, he no longer has the agility to play at left back. But also, more importantly, the technical insurance he provides the team with his pass selection and the passing range in the center of the pitch is something they do not have without him. 
and to sacrifice that and push him into left back is, is, <laughs> is self-destructive. And I don't know if this might be the game where the manager decides that, you know what, let me revert to type and then play him in our comfort zone because he's, he's Ukraine's best threat. If you take away Mikhail Mudrik, I mean, from, from the roster that they've got, he's, he's the best player that they've got in that team. And in a, in a game like this, there is no better time to play in a manner that accommodates the skill sets and more importantly, deploys your best players in their natural habitats. That's the, that's the one way you can go out with your head up, held up high, knowing that you did your best and then it was not enough. All right, so um, Turkey are up against um, Czech Republic. A quick word on Belgium before Turkey. Mm. There is uh, one player that I think people have been a bit unfair to, Jeremy Doku. Tell me why. People, people mock him. And I, I was just going through the numbers oh. of what... <laughs> people mock him every day. I was just going through the numbers of his performance. And he is about the best performing winger in the competition. He's completed, the more, players, in fact. he's completed more dribbles than any winger out there at nine. He's created more chances than I mean, any winger is, is this a typical case of, of, of football fans not understanding the role that a player is playing? Not I mean, necessarily. Kind of... So the mistake that he made that led to the one goal the team conceded mm. is what people hold against him. Okay. And I can understand that because that early in the game, you did not expect him to take that risk, right, against Slovakia. You do not expect him, because in the opening 10 minutes, co yes, coaches would expect you to be brave, but you do that within reason, right? Within reasonable boundaries. But he took that risk and unfortunately it backfired. But I think he's one of those players who's um, done pretty well in this competition and deserves a bit more praise, at least from the two games that they've played, than people give him vitriol for. Portugal. Mm. So Portugal, uh, Portugal are safe, they are in there, yeah. uh, in leading Group F, uh, six you. points there. Turkey Thank on you. three, Czech Republic on one, and Georgia on one. So, um, this game between Portugal, Turkey. let's begin with uh, Turkey versus yeah. um, Czech, you know, Czech Republic. Republic. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be uh, a pulsating game, that is what I foresee. Uh, you look at the way Czech Republic performed in their last game against Georgia, they had about 12 shots on target. Uh, they scored just a goal, obviously. That's not so good. But yeah, it clearly tells you their intent, how they commit more men forward, how they want to get goals for the team. But when you look at the performance of Turkey as well, against Portugal, Portugal, I think they were not that bad. Their result was obviously dispiriting, but their performance was quite okay. It was because of a, a de defensive blunder that really caused the team. Because after Bernardo Silva struck and they were trailing, they were still in the game. But the back pass and then the own goal and all that clearly dispirited the team. And for me, they, they couldn't recover from that. I think they have the players. Uh, the players should just step up against Czech Republic. Republic themselves, they've got really, really good players. And I see a very, very open game with end-to-end -end stuff. But I still think Turkey would have the edge over Czech Republic tonight. Yes, look, okay. I have one wish. Mm. My wish is that... Patrick Chick should score. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Two of the most entertaining teams in the competition so far are in Group F, Turkey and Georgia. I sincerely wish that Turkey would win Georgia and Georgia would beat Portugal. Georgia will beat Portugal. I have liked the football there. Well, it's, it's possible. I yeah, mean, it's... so that at least you have all three teams, or those two teams joining Portugal, to, because I can't take the haram ball Portugal are taking. Look, I'll take what Georgia do. Over what, because Portugal, for all intents and purposes, have more quality than, they, than they've shown so far in this competition. The, the confused, in the first game, the manager was playing in a system that somehow played Cancelo further up the pitch than Bernardo Silva and then Bruno Fernandes. I don't know what tactical principles or philosophy will accommodate. It should not have happened in the first no, place. No, but it has, and he's rectified it. That's what coaches do. Coaches are proactive, to, to they're not reactive. To, to something we, we, we don't normally do, um, Prediction. let's look at the score lines for you. Oh, I know you don't agree with Portugal losing, right? No, the, the manager of, he has confirmed that he's going to make changes, mm. but then they still have quality on the bench. So score line? Yeah, I think Portugal would win 1-0. One 1-0 nil. One nil, uh, Portugal, uh, Czech Republic, Turkey? Me or at you? At you. <laughs> <laughs> Take it to win 2 1. Okay, at you, Belgium, Ukraine? Belgium 2 0. Slovakia, Belgium Romania? Belgium keeping a clean sheet. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's Slovakia, Mudrik, Romania? Romania 2 1. 
Okay. <laughs> Let me just remind all of you that uh, coverage of the Euros, especially on radio, is in kind uh, collaboration with Sporty TV and Sporty Bet. Sporty TV and Sporty Bet have selected matches. All you need to do is go on channel 36 of your digital TVs and you're going to catch some of these games. Remember, we're bringing you live commentary on all of our radio platforms here at the Multimedia Group. And we're bringing you uh, some uh, special programs, including this one, uh, Euro uh, Today. So uh, thanks so much to our friends at NASCO. NASCO, bring home happiness. Like I mentioned, you have to uh, be very, very alert for tomorrow and Friday because we'll be giving away a NASCO prize. Thank you so much, Mubarak. Thank you so much, um, uh, Victor. And we will be back. We'll bring you another show tomorrow. Let's just see how these predictions go uh, for later today. You stay well, and uh, we'll be back. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Nathaniel Lato, and I have love for sport.